Today's lesson is entitled, Those Winter Sundays. Named after a poem written by Robert Hayden. For your do now, please take out your student unit packet. In your student unit packet, you will find multiple graphic organizers to use while you listen to the lesson. The first graphic organizer in your student unit packet is the KWL chart. In the K column, it says, what do you know? Take time right now to write one thing you know about African American life in Detroit during the 1920s. Great. Now write one thing you already know about the author, Robert Hayden. Excellent. In your W chart, it says, what do you want to know? In this column, you will write one thing you would like to know about African American life in Detroit during the 1920s. Awesome. Underneath that, write one thing you would like to know about the author, Robert Hayden. Great job. Leave the L column blank for now because it says, what have you learned? So midway through the lesson, we'll come back and revisit this KWL chart and you'll write two things that you've learned. Today's lesson essential question. In what way does Robert Hayden's use of imagery shape meaning and tone in the poem, Those Winter Sundays? Imagery is when you use the five senses such as sight, touch, taste, smell, and hearing in order to evoke mental images in the reader's mind. Meaning is the overall message of the text or the theme of the text. And tone is the author's attitude toward the subject. Again, our lesson essential question is, in what way does Robert Hayden's use of imagery shape meaning and tone in the poem, Those Winter Sundays? Let's get into some historical background and context. Turn to your next graphic organizer in the student unit packet. This one says about the author. It has three columns, infancy and childhood, family and personal life, and education and career. While I review details regarding the author's life, you are going to write at least one fact in each of those columns. Robert Hayden was born August 4, 1913. He died February 25, 1980. This is a picture of him. His name at birth was Asa Guffey Sheffy. His parents separated at birth and he was raised by the neighbors who later became his foster family. He had vision problems, was a victim of bullying, and suffered from depression throughout his childhood. However, he did manage to make it to college, and he was a graduate of Detroit City College with a major in Spanish and a minor in English. After college, he participated in the Federal Writers Project. This project, in this project, he wrote predominantly about black history and folk culture. He spent 23 years as an English professor at Fisk University and then 11 years as a professor at the University of Michigan. His personal life, he married a woman named Irma Inez Mars, who was a pianist. She was also the supervisor of music in Nashville Public Schools. They later had a daughter named Maya. In your graphic organizer, make sure you have at least one fact regarding his infancy and childhood family and personal life, and his education and career. Take time to do that now. Historical background and context regarding Detroit in the 1920s. This is the era in which this poem was written. Some fun facts about Detroit. Many people were moving to Detroit from all over the world. So the actual city grew from 81 square miles in 1917 to 139 square miles by the end of the 1920s. The population grew from 466,000 people in 1910 to one and a half million people in 1930. And 75% of these people were first generation Americans. Unfortunately, segregation was at an all time high and residential segregation was at the top of the list Due to the housing crisis, with so many people coming in, it was very difficult to find housing for them all. So the government instituted projects that were built for low-income communities. Many African Americans ended up living in project homes. Another thing that they instituted was racially restrictive covenants. So these racially restrictive covenants dictated where you can live based on your race. All right, before we read our poem, we're going to go back to the KWL chart. You remember this KWL chart from the beginning. This is a good time to write some things that you have learned. What have you learned about African-American life in 1920s Detroit? Write one thing. Great. Now, what have you learned about the author, Robert Hayden? 
write one thing. Excellent. Now we're going to read our poem. The poem, Those Winter Sundays. Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue, black, cold. Then, with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather, made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. Speaking indifferently to him, who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere? and lonely offices. Okay, a couple of definitions I want to clue you in on chronic and austere. The word chronic here is an adjective. It can mean an illness that persists for a long time or something that's just long lasting and difficult to eradicate. So if it's long lasting, it's chronic. The next word is austere which means to be severe, strict in manner, have no comforts, luxury, so basically something that's very, very harsh, or having an extremely plain and simple style or appearance, being completely unadorned, austere. All right, so back to our poem, Those Winter Sundays. We're going to analyze this poem for imagery using our graphic organizer in the student unit pack. So turn to the next graphic organizer. This is a graphic organizer you should have in front of you now. We are going to look for textual references that evoke imagery and then write what it makes us think of. So let's go stanza by stanza. I'll do the first one. Those winter Sundays. Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue black cold. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. What stands out to me most as far as imagery is concerned is blue, black, cold. Because what it makes me think of is frostbite. If the cold is blue, black, I think of frostbitten fingertips. So that stands out in my mind first. So back to our graphic organizer, what I would put under textual reference is blue, black, cold. And then I write in the box next to it, what it makes me think of is frostbite. Great. Let's do the second one together. Let's find another textual reference that evokes imagery. Going with the second stanza. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call. And slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. There are multiple words and phrases in this poem that evoke imagery. What phrase stands out to you the most in this second stanza? Excellent. I thought of that too, the chronic angers of that house. Let's put that in our graphic organizer. Chronic angers. Remember, he said cold splintering. So that kind of goes with chronic angers. I'm I'm going to add that to your answer, chronic angers. So chronic angers and cold and splintering. Chronic angers, cold and splintering. What does it make you think of with regard to a house? Great. I think of cold splintering wood because wood tends to shift with the weather. So if the weather is cold and you get up out of bed, you might hear that wood creak, especially if the house is old. So we have cold splintering wood, so it's not very pleasant to walk upon. And then the chronic angers of the house, what does that make you think of? Excellent. I too think of that howling wind outside the windows. That would be that chronic anger. So the combination of the howling wind and the creaking floorboards when you get up out of bed and the just sheer coldness of the day is certainly a chronic anger of the house. Great job. So for this third one, you're going to work independently. Take another look at the poem. Let's look at the third stanza. Speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? Which word or phrase stands out to you that evokes imagery in your mind? 
think of parent relationships. Think of a father and son relationship. Think of um, an attitude the father, the son has toward the father. Think of those things. Once you have your textual reference, right next, right beside it, what does it make you think of? Share your answer with the class. Excellent. Polishing the good shoes. So even just the word polished kind of gives us that mental picture of these bright, shiny shoes, right? So it makes us think of shoes, but it also makes us think of how well taken care of this boy is, despite his ingratitude. And we know he's ungrateful because no one ever thanks his father, not even him, right? And then another way we know that he's ungrateful is because he spoke indifferently to him. And this man is providing pretty much seven days a week with cracked hands and a blue black cold. So we know that ingratitude exists. Excellent job on analyzing this poem. Now we're going to take a look at tone. Okay, so I'm going to pause here. The next instruction state that I'm going to just tell you how I would wrap up this lesson. So what I would do here at the bottom is very similar to the top where the students would look at each stanza and write about tone, the author's attitude toward the subject, and then what it made them think of. I would do it in the same order. I do it. The second one, we do it together. The third one, the students do it on their own and then share with the class. As a form of assessment, I'll do the journal reflection. So this is where they actually get to write two paragraphs. In what way does Robert Hayden's use of imagery shape meaning and tone in the poem, Those Winter Sundays? Well, there was part of the lesson that was not presented discovering theme. So they also have this graphic organizer to help them discover theme as they answer those three questions and cite the text. They can write the theme in one or two sentences. So they have theme, they have tone, and they have imagery with these two graphic organizers. And then for the journal entry, they are going to write in two paragraphs an answer to the lesson essential question. After that, for the exit ticket, if anyone still has a question, they can write it on an exit ticket, and then I will answer it before class ends. If they do not have another question, they can write at least one thing they learned on the exit ticket. Differentiating instruction, there's going to be vocabulary assistance for those who need it. Um, tone words sometimes are difficult. And when you think of the author's attitude, sometimes our vocabulary, sometimes vocabulary is limited. So I've taken care of that by providing the students with a four page document that has different words that you can use for tone. These words are accompanied by definitions. So instead of saying sad or I think the author was happy, they can actually come up with a higher level word with the definition to use for tone. This expands their vocabulary. For those whose reading comprehension are lower, I have read the poem, I've read it multiple times, I read each stanza of the poem, and I provided definitions. Different ways that this lesson is differentiated. It's differentiated based on content, process, and product. The content is differentiated because I provide graphic organizers that I created. This provides scaffolding for students who need that extra support while listening to the lesson. This eliminates a lecture format and allows an interactive, engaging classroom. Process. Support for vocabulary is provided with the definition of tone words. I defined difficult to understand vocabulary words, and I provided support for tone words so they're not just thinking of a word off the top of their head. And the end product is differentiated because on the exit ticket, instead of just a question, if they don't, if they don't have a question, they can also write one thing they have learned. In addition to that, the two paragraphs are pretty open ended so they can use these graphic organizers to answer the lesson essential question. So a lot of their notes are already there and they have that help and support answering the lesson essential question. Thank you.